Hi guys and welcome to ArcVis. In this video we will have a look on stable diffusion and see how it compares to other image generators like Midjourney and specifically architectural concept development because I think this is the place where they are the strongest for us architects at the moment. It's even quite interesting in architectural visualizations and illustrations I would say and there's a few reasons for that which I'll talk about throughout the video so hang in there to hear why. But right away I'll say that a couple of reasons why it's interesting is that the code is public and it's free to use. That's also a huge thing, especially when we're using it a lot. It's quite a substantial, I would say, argument for using tools like Stable Diffusion. Also, you can install it on your PC locally as long as you have a decent graphics card with some RAM, at least four gigabytes of RAM and you have the full rights to the pictures you create. So that's a great thing about Stable Diffusion. The image you see here is from Stable Diffusion. I've created this with a particular model that focuses on architecture. And obviously, as you can see, it has some input that focuses on Frank Lloyd Wright's Guggenheim Museum in New York. But we will talk about uh, the different models in Stable Diffusion later on. And that's one of the other great assets of Stable Diffusion that we will take a thorough look into in this video and other videos later on, because I really think that this Stable Diffusion is another interesting model in the architectural space. You can also play with it in the browser here, for example. I'll copy all the links, but in the huggingface.co up here, you can type in everything you want here. Let's just try something. Let's type in a modern house just to see if that gives us any great results. Yeah, as you can see here, you get uh, four just as we know in Midjourney, and these results are not that interesting. They are not particularly useful, as you can see, compared to what the installment of Stable Diffusion can deliver when you use the right AI models for doing these images. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about the requirements. You have to have a graphics card with a GPU. The fastest way to see if you have that, you hold control, shift, and then escape. And then you get this menu here with the processes and performances and so forth. Just go into the performance tab there and go down here to check your graphics card. And there is uh, quite a few graphic cards that works with the Stable Diffusion. NVIDIA is one of the cards. Also, you have to check down here that the dedicated GPU memory is over four. I have 10 here, but you just have to have over four. So then you are good to go. And then obviously you have to have some hard disk space. So check your hard disks on your computer to see if you have at least 10 gigabytes and you can install Stable Diffusion on any drive. You don't have to allocate space on the C drive, for example. I installed mine on the D drive. So before we can install Stable Diffusion, there is two prerequisites. The first one is Git and you'll have to download it from here. You can see the link up here. I'll also link to the web page in the description so you can grab it from there. But you have to first download Git for Windows here and you do that by just click here on download. So Git is originally a source control management system, but we'll just use it to download Stable Diffusion and keep Stable Diffusion up to date. So just click the link here. When it has downloaded, just go into your download history. As you can see here, I've already done it. And therefore, there is a one here, but you obviously just double click the Git and then you'll get this and you can just click next. And then all these uh, options here, you just leave them as is. I have installed mine, so I won't go through the whole process, but you just click next to the next five to 10 menus. There's quite a lot of clicking next here. You just go through them and just install it on your computer. The next prerequisite is Python. You have to install it via this link here. Again, I'll provide the link in the description. But the Python version that works with Stable Diffusion is this 3.10.6. So you just scroll down this page and find the relevant link here. For most of you, it will be this link here, Windows Installer 64-bit. So you just click that. That's also the recommendation here. You just open the download folder again and you can see the Python is up here. I've downloaded it before, so there's a one here, but you'll just see the exit file there. You just double click it. Yeah, so I've already Python installed on my computer. So when you install it, there will be two tabs down here. And one is saying whether you want to add Python to path. You have to enable that so that it does add Python to path. When you've done that, you just go through the installation and install Python on your computer. 
Python is the program language that Stable Diffusion is written in, so that's why we install that. Okay, so now that we have these two prerequisites installed, we can install Stable Diffusion. We are installing something called a fork web UI. A fork is just a detached code from the main code. So the web UI is the most popular way to run Stable Diffusion and works through the web. Therefore, web, you know, user interface, it runs via a browser to the internet and you have a graphical interface which makes it easier to control and interact with Stable Diffusion. So that's why the web UI is the way to go. And it's optimized to operate on consumer hardware, which is most likely what we more or less all use. So the first thing we do is to go and open Explorer. You just open the little box there. It's Windows plus E, but you can also do it like this. This is the Windows Explorer. Then you just go to your hardware. It could be wherever. I've installed it here. And then you just right click and make a new folder there and call it Stable Diffusion like that. I've already created a folder like that, so I won't do it. You can see it here. When you have created it, you just open the folder like that and go into the address here and type command cmd and press enter and then the command prompt opens. Then you type git clone and then you paste the github link up here. Looks like this. I'll provide it in the description as well. And then you click enter. And then the Git will clone the repository from this location into exactly where you have just made your folder for Stable Diffusion. I won't click enter here because I've already done it. But when you have done this, just click enter and then it'll take some time. Just let it run through. It will take a couple of minutes. So I've already done that. And so if you open your Stable Diffusion folder, you will be able to see the Stable Diffusion web UI here. So if you open that, you can see here's all the files that makes Stable Diffusion run on your computer locally. Yeah, so the next thing we will do is to load a model for Stable Diffusion. A model is the engine that decides what to do with your prom. So that's very important, obviously. You can do that by this address up here from the huggingface.co and you just scroll down to this original GitHub repository and there's two models. We'll just download the light one. There's one on four gigabyte and one on approximately eight gigabyte. I've just downloaded this one. So you just click it and you'll download it. And that's quite a big file, as you can see here, four gigabytes. So you'll just wait on that. So I can say while it's downloading, the idea of models is one of the big upsides, I would say, with Stable Fusion. There are so many different cool models made in this open source code, and some of the models are quite interesting. And I will later show you how you can change between the different models so that you can get kind of different results. Also, you can blend the two models so that you will make your own third model out of two other models. So you have your own model. And obviously, if you're a very hardcore expert on this, you can code your own model and train your own model. So it really is quite interesting also in the future where maybe you could code models in Stable Diffusion that do very, very specific tasks in your architectural workflow. And we've talked about this already a couple of times in our videos here because some of the very interesting prospect of this new technology will, I'm very sure, be in the future that we can have AI in very specific corners of our workflow to help us with very specific tasks. Concept development in a special style could be one little corner where we could have our own models developed or merge different models together to get very, very specific results. That's a very, very interesting way of attacking this and much more specific than, for example, Midjourney. So this is already here. One of the things I will say straight away, that idea about bringing in different models that are trained differently into architecture to solve different pieces of the puzzle in the architectural workflow is very, very interesting. It's maybe one of the biggest points in this video, and you will see later on what I exactly mean by that, because we'll try some of the models. This is one of the pictures that we got for these models, so I think it is very, very interesting. But here it's done downloading, so you go to the folder and you have the model here. So you remember that we have our Stable Diffusion folder here. We can just go to the Stable Diffusion where you use the Git to get the Stable Diffusion Web UI folder here. 
you just open the folder, you scroll to models there, you click that, you go to stable diffusion, and then this is the place where you can paste all your models. So just take the just downloaded model and copy it into here. I already have this model. As you can see, it's this model here, so I won't do it, but you just drag drop the model into that folder there and the model should be working when you are starting up stable diffusion. So far, so good. After you've done that, go to Stable Diffusion Web UI there. Then you have to scroll all the way down, go into the Web UI User Bad. You'll just right click and go to Edit. Be prompted with this text prompt, and you just have to type at the very top of this text prompt Git pull, like that, and then obviously save this and close. That way, Git will pull or download the latest of Stable Diffusion Web UI repository. So that's why you're doing that. Then you can go out on your desktop. Then you'll just go to the web UI user.bat and then right click hold and drag into there. And then you'll make a copy or a shortcut on the desktop. I already done that again. So it's right here. And then you can just double click that shortcut and it'll go in and load the web UI user interface and it'll open a command prompt that just loads Stable Diffusion into a web browser from where you will operate Stable Diffusion in this web or internet browser user interface. So it's very, very easy for you to navigate and understand, or I wouldn't say it's very, very easy because it is a little bit nerdy. So here you can see the web UI here on the left hand side and here is the server. And one thing to be mentioned is that here you can follow all the things that Stable Diffusion are doing. If you're making a prompt and it renders and it's stuck, you can see here whether the program has crashed or is still you know, operating on the image. So you can just see how it operates here. Also, one thing to mention is that first time you launch Web UI, it will take some time to load the Web UI server. So just let it run through. It will take up to, I don't know, 10 minutes or something like that. So don't get afraid. It will take some time the first time you do this. So this is Stable Diffusion UI. Up here, the most important thing to discuss is the Stable Diffusion checkpoint. So checkpoint is the same as the model. Here we can see our models. So now we are just trying to use this model here we have downloaded. So I just click on that and Stable Diffusion is processing the model, is loading the model. If you download other models, you can do it from this page, Civit AI there and then you are directed to this web page here with all kinds of models doing all kinds of cool things landscapes which architects also can use obviously but we are interested in architecture so we just click architecture and then the home page will search all the models or checkpoints uh, that is made for stable diffusions regarding architecture Checkpoint is just when you stop training an AI model at some checkpoint, you just stop the model and then you release it for use. That's why it's called Checkpoint. If you use the LoRa, LoRa is just an extension upon a model so that you can refine a model, but you can just concentrate on the checkpoint. I, for example, downloaded this and you just go into this checkpoint here you can read all about it you can scroll down and see examples of what the checkpoint is able to do it'll just load so here you can see examples and up here you can just download it and when you have downloaded it you just throw the model into our stable diffusion model library there as you can see up here then just close stable diffusion there and the server there and reload it on the web ui here and the model should be loaded. Also, you have to refresh up here and then you can see your new models here. There is also other ways you can do it. You can browse and download models with an extension called Civit AI Browser. It's in here where you can search here, but that's uh, maybe for another video. So that's the model. That's the AI engine which will interpret your prompt here and give you a result when you click generate. So that's maybe the most important thing in Stable Diffusion to understand how that works. The next thing is all these tabs. All these tabs are different installments to Stable Diffusion and you can do all kinds of things. 
I've downloaded some extensions here so I can see images that I've produced. For example, here, if I type building, table diffusion searches all the prompts I've made with the word building in, so you can load them from here. But there's all kinds of possibilities in these tabs up here. Here you can see system info. That's also an extension. Extensions you install from this, just press here and then load from this location here, the GitHub location. And then you just type in the extension, for example, image browser and I have it installed here so you can't see it here but uh, that's the way you install them and then just click install and then you go to installed and then check for updates and then you apply and reset and restart the UI here just like that and it'll reload as you can see here you don't have to concentrate about that uh, just right now the one we are concentrating our energy in this video on is uh, the image to image and the text to image as you know this text to image is more or less the way we do it in mid journey and more or less the way you can say we do it in chat GPT, where we just prompt the AI model with something to think about. For example, I've prepared this prompt here, a photo of a futuristic innovative building design, green spaces integrated with the facade, rooftop gardens and vertical greenery cascading down the sides. And we just click generate here. And this model, the version 1.5, will take this prompt and interpret it and generate an image with these parameters. So that's the kind of the idea. And right off the bat, you can see it's not that impressive to say the least, but it is an interpretation of this prompt using this checkpoint of this model. Also down here, you can see there's a negative prompt here. Let's say there was a bunch of cars or something like that. You can just type cars here and the image will be rendered without cars. Another thing to mention is that you can just take the absolute same prompt and then generate again and you will get a new iteration. So already here, I think uh, the idea is quite clear and actually quite interesting, I would say. Maybe I should put myself over here like that. And so this is all the parameters that tells this model how this prompt should be rendered out. So you can dive into all these kinds of parameters here. And there's a lot of parameters in Stable Diffusion. It's quite a nerdy application, I would say. Also, you can go to the setting here and there's all kinds of parameters you can set for almost anything. So you can dive really deep into this. It's kind of like if we had the open source code for MidJourney and a web UI or a browser which could control all the parameters, so to speak. It's kind of the same here, it just that MidJourney has a more closed off interface and Stable Diffusion is open source and you can dive into it, but it's also more complicated. And that's one of the conclusions also to this video, but we'll talk about it in a minute. Yeah, so if you look down here in the generation tab, the first thing we should have a look on is the sampling steps. So the way Stable Diffusion is generating the images is to sample a picture of a lot of noise into something meaningful picture wise this sampling steps here is a slider that dictates how many times it samples over noise to refine it so the more times it is sampling the noise or the image the more refinement there will be so the more samples the more time it will use and the result will be a more refined result about 20 to 30 would be a good range to sketch let's just set it to 20 here in our case and over here, you can see the sampling method. There's a rollout here and you can see that's how this model samples the noise every AI image generator starts with. And the schedule type dictates how the denoising process in diffusion happens. So you can say the sampler and the scheduling type and the sample steps is the way the model makes sense of the noise and bring forth the picture, the actual picture. So this is more or less a chaotic process. We can, for example, try this Keras scheduling type. We can try something uh, Eula A, for example, here and 20 sampling steps and see what the program comes up with. And then it brings in a couple of seconds. It's even faster than Midjourney. It comes up with this picture here, which is something absolutely different. We can try to generate with the exact same uh, steps again. You can see that's another sample again here. We can try with, let's just try something, Eula that's again a totally different quite bad picture but it'll get better i promise but let's just um, go back to this one and click generate on that one and get a somewhat reasonable idea 
I find this sampling method to be quite important in the generation process, but you have to play around with this. You have to play around with different kind of uh, diffusion checkpoints or models. And you have to play around with the sampling method to get a result that you expect or that can you know push your project or push your way of seeing uh, your project or seeing ideas that you can really enjoy and get something out of and also the schedule type here try different settings here and see what's good for you i would say i found this keras to be very good in architectural sketch design or concept development and i found this to be okay also but again there's quite a lot of possibilities but for now let's just take this dpm plus plus 2m with the keras schedule type and around 20 samples and just click until we get something that's more or less useful for something okay let's see this design is is quite okay or actually, let's try to bump this up a little bit just to see what is happening then. Okay, so that's quite interesting, actually. Could we try something other than this? Yeah, you really just have to try these uh, features out. It has also a lot to do with the speed in which you're operating your renders. I think this is, that's not a good engine that. Yeah, I don't know, that's not particularly good either, this comes up with quite annoying ideas it's not very useful this this looks a little bit more like you know a facade collage or something like that but the thing i found also to be very important is this engine up here the base model isn't that good and so you can try to download something else as i told you before i downloaded this the architecture exterior sd and you can just do it here and as i said just uh, throw it into the directory of the models so let's try that actually i think it's this so you just load up here and then we try to generate again. Yeah, so already now you can see there's maybe a little bit more interesting ideas. Yeah, this is much better. And try to uh, look how fast it is compared to mid-journey because you don't want these ultra-refined pictures necessarily in concept development. It's just, you know, go through a lot of ideas very fast. But okay, let's say this is relatively interesting and we want to refine this in some way so obviously you can see here this is the resolution you can kick in all kinds of resolutions here that you like note that the largest resolution is quite high it's 2048 compared to mid journey which is a bit lower you can upscale it in a resolution that's close to this but also stable diffusion if you render out a idea in this high resolution have some possibilities and we'll have a look on that in a later stage in this video about how to upscale and it's not just uh, upscale like in photoshop in these uh, at least old uh, third party upscalers it's ai upscale so it interprets what it sees and then it tries to add reasonable or meaningful details to the upscale so the result is very very different but you can really make some quite large pictures i would say here to really get a large picture which you can upscale again with ai again and then you can zoom in on the pictures and even find let's say concept within the picture let's say well that's a bad example but anyway let's say this building isn't that interesting but this building over here is interesting with a large image you can kind of zoom in and get inspirations from the whole picture for your project or how to solve you know this facade and what could be a good way to make this space or this garden in front of the house or what could be a good lighting situation in this particular render or what could be interesting materials and compositions of materials and what could be an interesting form language and what could be a good concept design for the whole thing and so forth it's actually not that irrelevant that we can scale up the pictures in such a high resolution all these ai image generators started quite small and then it's just got more and more large pictures which is quite interesting actually to try to sketch in a little larger resolution than just these small pictures also let's try for example i have this architectural version 11 checkpoint or diffusion model up here i think it was if we go back into civet ai go back into this i think it was this so the architecture real mix that's a very very good engine can make some absolutely astonishing results so let's just try with that engine and we have the same prompt 
with no cars and a low resolution with these sampling methods just click generate and see what that engine comes up with and already here you can see it's quite a nice results already here let's just try to bump that up to 1024 by 1024 and just generate again yeah, so you can see this takes a little longer this when you just bump it up like you know double the, the width and the height you have to remember that it's not a double for the model actually you have 512 here and then 512 here and then 512 and 512 here so it's actually four times the resources and the time spent on the render so if you render at 512 and it takes you know 10 seconds it'll take 40 seconds here and that's quite an enlargement you have to remember that when you are doing these renders but you can see here it's actually quite extreme with the stable diffusion the realism it uh, delivers in uh, some of these pictures with the right model and so when we are so impressed with for example mid journey it's because their text to image model is just really 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 good and trained and trained and trained on images and also trained that's maybe a little bit uh, controversial to say but the images, the image base on which Midjourney is trained is something many are talking about was images from other artists. And then all of a sudden Midjourney has its own library which it can iterate on. So they say now it's our own pictures, but you know, every model, every image model is trained on artists work and architects renders and concepts and so forth so all ai image generators built upon as we've already talked about hardworking artists and architects prior concepts and images and projects really so we have to bear that in mind and that's also a thing with stable diffusion the ethics behind stable diffusion is better because you can actually if you were an expert in this and we've also talked about this my idea about this whole technology is that we need more architects and illustrators and artists to become experts in this so that we can train our own models in an ethical way with our styles and so forth yeah, so we can use these models without you know generating images and styles and so forth of artists and they have worked their whole life to get this style it's a gray area and you can say in concept development is it okay to go out into the world and get inspirations from existing projects and see a great render that inspired you and so forth that's obviously okay so that's why i think this whole concept development using ai image generators is absolutely fine it's okay it's a fast way to iterate a lot of ideas but when you are moving into you know copying artists and selling your craft by using other artists hard work i think you're in a gray zone i must say and it's uh, at some point there must come some laws about this because in the music business if you take music from someone and make a slight iteration over it it's not okay but apparently in image generation and illustrations and architectural renders and so forth it's not a problem i think that's a huge discussion i must say and the ethics about this industry and tech spamming the markets with models that's based on other hardworking artists and architects prior works is i would say a little dodgy actually um, we have this render here in a high resolution so let's just bump it down a little bit because it's too long to wait for these renders yeah and let's just try to generate another iteration in a smaller resolution here okay so this is also a great image over here you can see the batch count and the batch count is basically how many images you are producing let's try four in one generation so you can see here for example that's just as you know in mid journey mid journey is by default producing four images and you can see here we start with this grid of the images created this picture up here is actually quite good i would say you can shuffle through them like this yeah they're very inspiring i think you could actually use them for something and a concept so that's the batch count and the batch size it's how many images are generated per count so if this is two it'll create eight images two images for every count up here but just leave this and just use this up here for batch count on how many pictures you want to do 
I'll get into the CFG scale in just a minute because down here you can see the seed. Now we found a picture that we were very happy with. So you can see the seed is minus one. That means that you will get a new generation each time you press generate up here. So if for example, click here like that, you can see the number here we got is the seed for this here. So if we click generate again, the model with this prompt and the same seed will generate the same image here. The reason why it's a little bit confusing here is that the batch is for, so we just said the batch here with this seed here from the image we liked and then click generate. The model up here will take the prompt with this seed and generate exactly the same. So seed can kind of freeze an idea so that we can iterate on that idea. It's more or less like saying we like this image, we want to improve upon it and we want to, you know, make changes to this because that's also where diffusion has some extra utilities and ways to manipulate the picture. Obviously, you can't get a model from this just as in Midjourney and so forth. We are not there yet. And even if we were, the model would be maybe very complicated and it will be optimized to the view. And that's a whole new discussion because I think at some point we might have to take actually a different approach to concept development. And I have some thoughts about that because one thing is image generation, concept development, and another thing is model concept development. And so that whole space with scripting different models to get inspirations from is a very, very interesting field for architectures kind of flipped around. Now we are very focused on these image generators because they are producing very, very good results, very, very fast, but you can't use them really for anything also in stable diffusion other than concept development. But to kind of flip that method to iterate with AI some model iterations of a project is a very, very interesting idea also. And we have to take a look at that at some point. I will dive into that. And can we somehow merge these two worlds? I think that's the intersection where this becomes very interesting. Also, just as it is right now, can we somehow generate AI 3D model solutions that kind of inspire us architects or designers for a design or a piece of architecture? and kind of model that or remodel it or just shape it a little bit, just um, push it a little here and there and scale it correct because none are talking scale in architecture, but that's very, very important. Scale kind of the 3D sketch into something that fits our room program and, you know, aesthetics and functionality and all that thing we discussed earlier in uh, more concept development focused videos and then merge it into an image generator that helps us get us ideas about lighting and materials. And so it's kind of like not only concept development inspirations from Stable Diffusion, Mid Journey and Dali and all these names. And when you have all that, you can kind of say, OK, we are very, very close to a concept design that is scaled correctly, that fits somewhat a room program correctly, that answers our assignment in terms of function, that has some aesthetics we like. We know something about the materials. We have an idea about when is it optimal to visualize this piece of architecture in terms of sunlight and and so forth. And then we start to really model. And then you can work on from the 3D iterated AI model you've already gotten and remodel them so that they fit with the image. And then you can render, I would say, the old school way so you have full control. I've made some videos that tells you about that whole process, which is very exciting and absolutely precise. And you have absolutely total control. And also you have the model reference, the BIM model reference that is the reference for all co-workers on the project. And you have to have that. And also that's the only way you can control the render exactly. That's the only way, even with stable diffusion. So I'll show you some things in stable diffusion that points towards stable diffusion being, if you are an expert in stable diffusion, you can really do some things also as an art -vis artist and also as a illustrator but you have to be an expert. And that's exactly the point from the last video I had about this technology. The second this becomes relevant in a real world setting or a real world project, you have to have expert to control also these programs. 
You've already seen it now. There's many, many ways you can control this and many, many settings and so forth you can dive into and all kinds of ways you can use this. And you will also find out in a second when I show you that it's not like, let's say, Photoshop where you can throw things around and it's nicely done and logical and it is very nerdy. You have to have experts on this field that are not only experts on a program, but that know something about architecture or at least know something about, let's say, concept development, if you use Stable Diffusion for concept development, and then you have set Stable Diffusions up for concept development with concept development engines, and you know what prompts to be using and sampling methods, and you know why it delivers what it delivers, and then you maybe have some Stable Diffusion illustrators, experts that uses Stable Diffusion to enhance their precise model-based visualizations. It's the same workflow. It's the same process every architectural project has to go through. The bar is just higher. Every process where an illustrator, an archivist, artist is working on a project, it's a ping pong between the designing architect, the illustrators, the landscape architects, the developers. It's a process back and forth. And it's not that an architect can't have a comment to an illustrator about, I don't think your illustration is good here. Try to make it more like this. And an illustrator can't say, I think your concept is lacking. What about doing it like this? When you know, when the designing architect knows something about illustration, for example, and the illustrator knows something about architecture, and the landscape architect, for example, knows something about building architect and vice versa, the whole project just lifts. It's a team more than it is, um, well, it is specialities, but it's specialities that can kind of intersect. And over the years, I've just found that the more intersection and expertise there are around all kinds of things, the better a project we can just make. And if anyone is saying to me, well, try this and I think it's a good idea, I'll just be very happy. That's cool. That's very, very cool. You know, a good architect knows when I say to him or her that your project could be better by maybe doing this. Could we try this? A good architect would say, okay, let's try it. If you're right about it, let's make some iterations about that. And when the architect is saying something to the landscape architect, why don't we refine this so that we can have a learning situation here so that we have some places to sit and so forth. You know, it's a back and forth, it's a team. And it's so important that the specialist is not, you know, uh, so isolated in their thought process that you cannot speak to each other and you cannot reach out. Every architectural project is so complicated and it'll continue with being complicated. I've only seen architectural project being more and more and more and more complicated. So this whole discussion about jobs and architecture, so far I've only seen AI push the bar up and made the process even more complicated. So, okay, let's uh, move on then. Yeah, that's the batch size, the resolution. Yeah, and we've talked about the seat. That's also very important. If you want a new iteration, we can just click this one. It'll set it to minus one, and then you'll get a new iteration when we generate here. Don't be afraid, this image is saved. So we just get a new iteration. And if we generate again with minus one, we'll get a new iteration of this. When we click here to freeze that seed and generate again, you can see it's the same picture. So that's the idea about that. Yeah, so the CFG scale is how closely is this prompt we've written up here, a photo of a futuristic innovative building, blah, blah, blah. How close is that prompt interpreted by the AI model, this real mix architectural model we are using up here. So if we bump the CFG scale down to one and generate, we can see that there is a lot of creativity for the model. And if we bump it up, let's say to 10 or something like that, it'll get closer to the prompt. So that's the whole idea with this CFG scale. If we bump it up, let's try to say 15 and then look down here. You can see it start to deliver very strange pictures. I don't know why, but there is some kind of limit to this CFG scale with some settings with specific models. So you have to be aware of that. Maybe the top CFG scale for this kind of prompt and with this model is maybe, I don't know, 10 or something like that. So be aware of that. You can kind of destroy, so to speak, the model. The CFG scale about seven, I think is the default. I think many models are made with this in mind. So the baseline is around seven. 
If you click here, that opens the output directory and we have generated a lot of pictures here. If we just go through them, there was one that was very good. That was this. Okay, so that's 40. We just close that. We can just copy from the prompt, go into the image browser, go into the keyword search, type futuristic innovative, and then we can find the picture here, I'm sure. Yeah, for example, here, this is the picture. So when you are in this extension, you can just send it to text to image. You can send it to image to image, and we'll try to do that. So you can see here, we are now in not the text to image where we generate the picture, we are in the image to image. So here we try to make some modifications to a design that we like. So that's very important also to understand with stable diffusion. You can kind of say, okay, we like this picture, then we bring it on in the process. Then we work with the image and the prompt together that will refine into something new that it inspired both by the prompt and the image. And you can set how much it should be represented, how important the prompt is and how important the image is. But that's very interesting. New kind of set of features we suddenly get. And back to the point about the speciality of the modern architect. I'm very sure that the expert in stable diffusion will have a place in the workflow as an architect. And this technology is not something that everybody can sit and do. If you really dive into this, you have to be quite proficient in computers. And if this was integrated in a workflow where there is pressure and, and stress and the projects are not 512 times 512 of a generative project, but a real huge project, this whole project relies on competence and expertise. And you don't just have to know the program and something about the coding. You also know about the architecture and I would say also illustrations, of course, how light works and how perspective works and how to storytell. We've talked hours about storytelling and selling a project. And also that is a whole speciality in and of itself. You can dive into in years and years and years, obviously. Another way to do it is if you open your directory of images here, for example, you can also just drag drop the image in here so you don't have to have this extension to use this it's quite flexible i would say actually uh, i think it was this yeah so that's also a way you can do it so we've been over some of these parameters is basically the same also we have the seed from before so when we press generate up here it will produce more or less the same. You can see it's not the same picture, but very close. It's because of this denoising strength. So the denoising strength, if we just set it to, let's say, 0 0.1 and then press generate up here, you would see a picture that very, very closely resembles this. You can see it with the context. Even the context is basically the same. The greenery is the same and this building hasn't changed much and so forth. So if you have the seed of this picture, the only place you want to iterate concept that is very close to this concept here is on the denoising strength modifier down here. You can play around with all these, but the second you play around, even with the resolution, the model thinks that the seed here is not the seed of this picture here because this seed has this specific resolution. So you change the way Stable Diffusion see the situation and it'll change the whole concept. So you have to make iterations down here on the denoiser strength and just generate. And you can see there was some subtle differences here and there is something with this facade here that change we can try to bump it up even further and see yeah so here we can really see that it's kind of the same let's say concept ideas but it's just a new iteration of let's say details in the facade and the glass placement and maybe the foreground as you can see here is a little bit different and so forth we can try to bump it even more up to see what happens yeah, then you can see it's, I wouldn't say it's a totally different concept because it's kind of like the same concept, but it's just like we have, I don't know, walk down here and see the whole thing from the other side or something like that. But we have obviously no control. So it's again, at this stage, it's very much concept development. We're using the Stable Diffusion 4 and see this whole idea with integrations of these boards like that. You can maybe flip them. That's kind of the same idea here, but this is a little bit a new form language. That's kind of this building integrated with this kind of lush facade here. So there is some merit, I would say, in this uh, image to image in terms of generating concepts that resembles a picture you like from the start and you just want to refine it a little bit.
yeah, for example, here you can see it's kind of the same project. It's just the foreground and the space here is just so much cooler now, actually. Maybe I like the building here, but with this ground here. So the way you do it in stable diffusion right now is to kind of take this picture here. Let's say we like, yeah, obviously you can go into Photoshop and then crop this out and paste it into this. So that's quite fast. You have a design iteration very fast there. But the other way around would be to, let's say we like this picture. So we take this picture and drag drop it over there. And then we work on this picture from here. We get a seat here, then the seat was this. So when we press generate with a low denoising strength here, we will get the same image as on the left side here. As you can see, it's more or less the same. So we can now take kind of a concept that sprung out of a process with a picture we were happy with, but just pushed it even further. And then we could just take this picture on the left here with the new seat, and then just bump up the denoise strength here and generate again. And then we have a concept development now that sprung out of this idea here, but again, a new iteration. All of a sudden we have, I would say, a bank now from something maybe more residential. That's maybe not the idea here. Try to bump it down a little bit, see if we can have an iteration that's very close to this. Yeah, for example, here we have more of a wooden facade there, some wood integrated there. And then the garden in front is maybe uh, quite cool here, actually. I don't maybe like this screen over here, but let's say the, the context of our specific site was more like this. This could be a more fair representation of a concept that integrates in the actual context in a more fair way or a little bit more precise way. So let's say we are happy with this. We take it over here and then we click on here to generate a seat and then we can make iterations again. Let's say, so now we bump down the denoise strength here. So the generation over here should be the same and it is, but we can again bump it up. So we get iteration that is inspired by this image to something totally different. And this is really totally different. That's kind of not the same concept anymore. So maybe the denoiser is a little too harsh. Let's bump it down to 0 0.7, for example, and try to generate that and see what happens. Yeah, we are back at the same concept level. And that's important to understand. The way these AI model generates their pictures is not a method we humans understand because why all of a sudden is it just absolutely a different concept, but the AI model works in another way. So you have to have kind of an understanding of why this works like it works and so forth. I would say the more AI comes into the space of architecture, the more we need specialists to control it that still know something about architecture and illustration. That's my whole point with these videos. Obviously, it's a fun new tool, this, but in a stressful situation, in a real project situation, for example, a competition, you really need to know what you're doing. That's so important. Okay, so let's say this iteration didn't do anything good. If it was a residential project, maybe this has some more warmth to it. But I think this is the best. I think we'll go into the next phase in stable diffusion to kind of showcase this interesting AI application. And then we just say, okay, we are more or less happy with this iteration of the concept. We just want to tighten up some details about the foreground or something like that. So you take this picture and then you press the InPaint tab down here and stable diffusion sent this picture into InPaint. You can also go up here in the InPaint tab up there. It's image to image and then InPaint. You can press down here or up here, that doesn't matter. So now we are in InPaint. InPaint means that we take this picture and then you can see we have kind of this brush here where we can make a brush color so you can see what we're doing and we can increase the brush size and then we can paint into the area of the picture we're not happy with. Let's say the, the foreground, we're not happy with the foreground or something like that. And we can make changes to that based upon this prompt up here. So InPaint is kind of like in Photoshop, when you take parts of the picture and redo iterations over that part of the picture. And so the first parameter you see down here, the mask blur, that's kind of like feather in Photoshop. If the mask blur is very high, all the edges here would have a feather of, let's say, 33 pixels here. And when we see them render iterations over different solutions in the foreground here, when let's say the transition between the changes we made and the old picture, if that transition is very hot, it's probably this mask blur you have to fiddle around with. So I would say around four to 10 or something like that. Let's try seven here. So there is kind of like a feather seven here on this mask here. 
So obviously here down in the mask mode, you can say is the in paint mask, is that the area we are making iterations over or is it all the other parts of the picture? Okay, so down here, this is very important. The mask content, whenever an AI model in Stable Diffusion makes iterations over the foreground, in this case of this picture, it takes the model, it sees on the prompt, and then it sees on these parameters down here, how it should interpret this prompt and make iterations. And so the mask content here, if it's on fill, it'll take all this content and it'll blur it. So it'll still have some color from the picture behind. And then it'll take this model and interpret with this prompt on this seat and make an iteration over it. If the mask content was on original, it'll take the exact picture, underlying picture, and make iterations over that. And if it take latent noise, it'll just noise the whole thing. So it'll come up with a totally different solution in this case with no inspirations from the actual picture and latent nothing. It'll just put in a solid color, which also gives some strange results sometimes. It's maybe usable when you have to, you know, remove some birds or a tree in the corner or something like that. But I haven't found this useful in so many cases, I would say. Try to stay on the original or if you want something totally different, latent noise. Yeah, so in paint area down here, you have the whole picture and the masked only. If you have the whole picture, kind of like the model takes inspiration in the whole picture and the colors of the whole pictures in making the foreground. And if only the mask, it'll only look at what you have masked to make iterations based upon. So that's a parameter you have to fiddle a little around with. Oftentimes you will want to take the whole picture, but if you take the mask only, you can kind of have masked only padding pixels here. It works more or less like I've explained up here with the mask blur. It kind of looks outside the mask area with this parameter here. In this case, let's say 48 pixels out from the mask and takes inspiration into the area from that border. Yeah, so let's just try to make a new foreground from this foreground we have down here. So we press on the picture and you can see this is the new picture where we have a different foreground. That's very, very interesting. Something I would say landscape architecture would have a huge benefit in learning to generate a lot of iterations based upon a context that is real and based upon a project that is real to get inspiration that could integrate in that kind of architecture and design out from that. And then from there, go classic, so to speak, model the thing precisely as you would want it. So we have a reference so we can make specific cameras, a real context, real illustrations, architectural visualizations of the actual project. Also, I would say for the landscape architect, this new technology is very, very interesting. Let's try something else. Let's try to bump up the denoiser strength a little more and see what it comes up with. You can see here it's very subtle changes now. Let's try something else. Let's try, let's bump it down. Yeah, you can see if you bump it down, it's more or less the same here. It's more or less the same foreground. Let's try to bump it extremely high and see what happens. Yeah, that's actually a great example here because you can see it's quite the same, let's say, concept, but different iterations of way to handle this foreground as a landscape architect. Also, if you keep the seat down here, so it notes this is the picture, you can kind of make the prompt a little bit different. For example, a sitting area with people in the foreground like that, and then just click generate. So the model takes this picture with this prompt, but only in this area and makes this. And you can see this is not good. And the thing about this is that the lighting is off and you can very, very clearly see that we need some more mask blur here. Let's try to bump that up, but maybe it's also a little bit too large of a change. So let's bump it a little bit down. Yeah, let's try generation here with these parameters. Yeah, this is not good either. You can see you kind of get a hard cut here where the mask is. It's better here. If we take the picture, it's better here, but it's kind of cut hard here also. So let's try to do something about that. I think we grab the brush up here and then just paint a little bit more into the, so that we can have a height here, for example, of approximately a human height here. And then let's take it the whole foreground here with the same settings, just with another mask and with this prompt here, try to generate to see if that changes anything. 
And all of a sudden, this is not good because this facade over here is suddenly something different. So we have to clear the mask and then just paint, let's say, a new mask over here. Kind of like that. And then generate again and see what it comes up with. So here you can see we have kind of kept the facade over here because the mask doesn't move into that area. And we have gotten this picture, which is somewhat usable, I would say, in this area here. But this is very, very strange. So you have to play around with these parameters. It's not, uh, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it will give you some iterations. That's good. That's actually quite good. They have nothing to sit on here, but it's a good idea to have some people like that. Let's see, what can we do? Let's bump that up. Let's try the fill in the mask content. So it'll blur this picture. So the iteration maybe is a little more a new idea. Let's see what happens. Yeah, that definitely is a new idea. And you can see it doesn't know what it's doing with uh, humans. Especially, I would say uh, humans is very, very hard for AIs to get right. I haven't seen a model that gets humans really, really good yet. But let's try to generate a little more on this. That's not good either. Maybe we shouldn't have people then. Uh, we have to make the people ourselves manually. But it doesn't matter in concept development and in a real world project, it doesn't matter either because you have to render it all. So it'll be a reference to the actual project, obviously. But in the concept development phase, let's try something else. Let's just say a lush green arc in the foreground. And let's see what Stable Diffusion does with that. Okay, so that's interesting. Okay, it actually has some people. I think they are okay in this case. They are not very, very good, but um, I guess they are okay. So if you're kind of okay with this, you can drag drop it over there. So this is now the picture that we're working with. You can give it a seat like that. And then you can paint into this area here. Just keep that prompt there. And in the negative prompt, say no humans, no people. Maybe the AI understands that. No, it's absolutely not listening. So let's try to fill original in paint. Let's try to denoise it a little bit more. No, it's not possible. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't know what is people and what is park. So that's another problem with AI. It's this very, very intelligent child that is very, very unwise and has absolutely no experience. So we have to take it into Photoshop, I think. So we go into this here and we just say open original folder. Yeah, over here. So we scroll down and then we say it was this. So we go into Photoshop like this. And this is our picture. We can obviously use all kinds of tools here. I think we should use the remove tool in this case. So we just have to remove this lady here and this lady here. That's by the way, also, you know, AI generated this. So we have this picture here and that's obviously, you can say it's very blurry. And let's try as the last thing in this video to scale this picture up so we can make a save. We make a copy. We can just make a copy in the directory from where it came. A large that's fine so we jump into stable diffusion again there and then we just remove this and then we go into the directory once again it's there and we have this copy we drag it in here we clear the brush there and then we have what we actually wanted stable diffusion to make to us yeah so we go down here in the script and we take the sd upscale that's the script down here that's made for upscaling we go into the r dash e s r g a n times four and click that that's the specific upscaler we use in this case take the denoiser strength down to 0 0.1 there about and then the cfg scale up to about round 11 like that the same resolution generate a new seed for this image because we drag drop a photoshop file into it and then the important part is this scale factor times two so it will be double the size so that'll be 1024 by 1024 and then click generate and it'll just take some time it isn't that long but it is like 10 seconds or something like that so we click on it. Let's just copy it and open in Photoshop to see the difference. Let's just close these. So this is the first image. If we double click the little zoom tool here, it's the actual pixel. So remember, if you have zoomed in or something, you would double click. 
then it's the actual pixels on the screen so this is the first picture here we go up to new clipboard and then just paste this is the new picture and if we zoom out a bit and then double click here you can see that's the actual pixel for picture number two so you can see here we actually got an upscale and it's actually quite okay so if we want to upscale it even more we just go into stable diffusion like that take the upscale picture from the right and drag drop it into this so we have the upscale now and we just run the process exactly with the same parameters again and generate and this upscale process will take longer and longer and longer if you scale it up to around two or three or four thousand pixels obviously but it's not just a let's say a dumb upscale there is a ai model that is trying to noise it and make sense of it so it'll just not upscale a, let's say a bush it'll upscale a bush so it'll start to paint leaves and so forth it interprets the picture and also there is settings to the upscale that can be tweaked around to get the best result especially i would say with humans the upscaler in the stable diffusion the models i've used until now at least it's sometimes a little bit hard to make them work and i've seen there are some trained models that actually can enhance parts of a visualization or parts of a picture regarding humans especially human faces to make them more realistic and the results i've seen so far in the few videos i've seen about it is quite promising that's something we could have a look on in a later time because especially when you render out with these 3d models of people every client i've talked to about people in pictures says they are not good and they don't fit in the picture but oftentimes especially if you lack time you integrate kind of in the middle and background more 3d assets like humans so they're not in the foreground and then you can maybe enhance them with ai tools afterwards and try to integrate them in a way but with these new tools there is maybe some possibilities to make the changes up in the foreground also so again it's just the bar is just higher and higher with the quality of these images that we produce and with the concept development and so forth but let's right click and copy the pictures get into photoshop make a new clipboard and paste our newly upscaled image and double click on the zoom tool yeah you can see here this is actual pixels that's quite a large picture and you can see we started here if we just copy this picture or we can even see what's the resolution here it's 2048 by 2048 so if we just paste the original picture there we go into view we go into snap then we take our old picture and just very fast upscale it like that with the transform tool so you can see if we zoom in a little bit this was the original picture this was the upscale picture again you can see it's not perfect you can upscale it in so many ways the right way to upscale a picture is to also try to generate a picture in higher resolution from the start but you are able to get some lift in quality i would say from this to this i would say there is some something very nice in the first picture also especially in the colors it's kind of like the colors is getting a little worse there i would say than there maybe it's because the image generation is very small 512 times 512 and there are other more advanced ways to scale up a picture the last thing we can have a talk about in this video is some of the things i've tried if we go into the stable diffusion web ui folder you can under output you can see all your generations it's auto saved in that regards so for example text to images this is the different dates you can see some of those pictures we haven't talked about but there's all kinds of generations in all kinds of stages of project development this was a miss van der rohe inspired project idea i had but yeah there's all kinds of generations and i've tried all kinds of things you could see it sometimes this child just runs absolutely wild these are very very i would say realistic and maybe a little boring but they are very realistic and they present a very very clear concept so they are not unusable this project i thought was very cool this was a very cool house i think an idea for a very nice house also this is also very cool yeah this was also very good again miss van der Rohe. all kinds of things there 
what was this some generations upscale ideas um also here playing around with different models i found a model that was good for frank light Wright projects this was a prompt about obviously falling water in pennsylvania also this this is a merge between let's say a rivendell setting in the lord of the rings and then frank lloyd wright we made a hogwarts daniel liebeskind merge in mid journey in the last video this is rivendell versus frank lloyd wright i guess yeah this was a inspiration about the pompidou center in france of richard rogers and renzo piano so i think that was very cool that's not very good, but it actually looks a little bit like Paris. So this was the Seagate building in New York inspired by that. It's easy to see there. They are quite good, I think, actually. This was obviously Le Corbusier, his Villa Savoy in Paris. This was obviously our Danish Jan Utzon, Sydney's Opera House, which was just an insane generation, I think. This looks like a picture from the 70s with analog cameras with extreme exposure. I don't know. Actually, a quite wild picture, this. It looks like something our parents could have taken on vacation in the 70s, huh? Yeah, this was also interesting. This was obviously Guggenheim Museum that was the inspirational source here. But this picture we used as the thumbnail. I think this is absolutely amazing, actually. I mean, that's a very, very cool idea, this. That looks like something Midjourney produces. Midjourney is good at these, uh, let's say, extreme concept design that is very well integrated in a uh, render. This is an interior inspirational picture of the same project. This is just very sketchy. This also, this, and this is obviously a Guggenheim from Frank Gehry inspired picture. Yeah, all these are not good all kinds of tests yeah so i'll wrap it up here it really was interesting time spent with stable diffusion and i think it opens quite a lot of doors i would say the stable diffusion is kind of this program that has its own right it will always compete with midjourney i think midjourney and stable diffusion is kind of like two very different brothers where Midjourney is absolutely king of the hill in one sense and Stable Diffusion is untouchable in another sense. It's more precise. The things that you can do in Stable Diffusion, especially with specifically trained AI models and dive really deep into the different menus and so forth and integrate them or augment them in your workflow in specific times where they are very strong is a very, very interesting idea and will have its place, I think, in the future architectural development process. It's hard to say precisely where, but I think still it is mainly in the initial design phase and concept development, because when you just take the first step towards a specific project, you have to have the reference model. It reference out to engineers, illustrators, entrepreneurs, or yeah, specialists to make deliveries on all kinds of systems, the financial calculations behind the project, all the, let's say, the visualization where you have to have lawmakers and so forth see the pictures of the actual house and make decisions based upon that. You cannot just throw an uh, AI generated generic picture to them. Not in any way, that's not possible. So I think, again, Stable Diffusion is very, very strong, just as mid-journey in the concept development phase. And I think Stable Diffusion has some merit to kind of trickle over into the, let's say, more refined stages of project development. It has some merit in some of the architectural visualization part. I think there are some possibilities to integrate part of what Stable Diffusion can do. Again, you're relying on a tool that is too uncontrollable as it is right now to use in any real world project with illustrations, I would say, because you have to base your illustrations upon the reference and that's the 3D model. It's more or less the same talk. I think Stable Diffusions moves a little closer to being integrated in some parts of that project. But again, then we have a tool that is very, very complicated to use precisely and exactly on that reference, that 3D reference. 
and that includes experts. I'm very, very sure you have to have an educated archivist, artist or illustrator to work with the pictures when that happens. And it's starting to happen already now where you see an augmentation of these AI tools into image generation and animations. And it will be more and more integrated over time. I'm very, very sure the final stage of this, I think, is something like, let's say, an integration with 3D Studio Max, for example, Revit or Rhino or SketchUp and so forth, where you can kind of control the materials, the parameters, the transparencies, the scale and so forth, the cameras, the camera paths and so forth, and then enhance, so to speak, your renders with AI. So you more or less just generate pictures faster or with more enhancement laid into the, let's say, render engine, it'll become a AI render engine. And then we are kind of going full circle because then we are back to, let's say, 3D Studio Max with V-Ray 2.0 or, you know, Corona 2.0, where this render engine is just enhanced with AI. That's really where this technology will end. The thing we illustrators are looking forward to is just better render engines integrated into our favorite reference tool, Revit, SketchUp, 3D Studio Max in my case. That's really what we are waiting for and it will happen at some point, whether it'll be some unknown for now company that'll integrate a plugin to, I don't know, 3D Studio Max so we can render with somewhat correct lights and ambient occlusion and so forth but AI enhanced, AI enhanced materials, materials that can help us not make tileable textures and so forth, integrate that into the real project, the real model, so that we can control everything we control now with masks and cameras and angles and matches to photographs in the real context with the real 3D reference model. That's just the next step. That's very um, natural for architectural visualizations as I see it. As it is right now, the augmentation between stable diffusion and architectural visualization is starting to happen. In some regards, there are ways you can use stable diffusion and I'll just in years merge, I'm very, very sure. So for now, it has been a very, very interesting video to uh, do and I hope you really enjoyed it. And uh, leave a comment below if you have anything to add to this video. I'm sure we'll be discussing this in the coming years. And I'm sure that the next project that we'll make on this channel will integrate some sort of stable diffusion AI generation in the project workflow that leads up from, let's say, a new assignment, a new concept baked into a presentation process. Because that's really what's very, very interesting, I think, on my channel, but in life as an architect and artist in this world. The whole architectural workflow that's been, you know, smashed around and modded and turned around and so forth over the past 20 years. And thing has been added and we've been able to put out nicer and nicer and nicer and nicer illustrations and better and better and better concept. The bar is just risen and risen and risen. But also all these tools, all these possibilities, that's something that can stress a workflow and can stress a humans in constant, let's say, educational development. But we have to also understand that not everything new and shiny is the best way to make an architectural project because some things will just make it more expensive and more complicated. And what do we get out of it? I'm sure in concept development, we've been over this a thousand times, but I'm sure in concept development, these new AI tools that has sprung up from, let's say, one to two years from now and are very, very interesting in concept development. And the augmentation will happen slowly into analytics about engineering tasks and flooding and fire and smoke and dimensioning and technical drawings and facade drawings and law, you know, make me a wall that is integrated with the laws there is in this country we're building in this country, make me a spatial drawing in one to 100 that integrate the laws in this country with wall thickness and isolations and yeah AI will just augment into every corner of the architectural workflow I'm very very sure also arc vis and illustration so 
with that, let's wrap the video up here. Hope you enjoyed it. And please let me know in the comments if you do. And write a comment about what you think about all this. As always, like, share and subscribe on your way out. And I'll see you in the next one.